Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Spotlight with Sandalina, and I'm your talk show host, Sandalina Sitar. Today's very special guest is Hira Mustafa, who is a beauty influencer and a third year law school student. So I met Hira for the first time at an event uh, during Fashion Week in 2023. Uh, Lily Singh and Avrani were announcing their hair care collab. Met Hira, she was one of the few Pakistani Muslims in the room. And the thing at these creator events is we all tend to gravitate towards each other <laughs> because we sort of are a minority within a minority. Um, and we instantly clicked and I've always been so enamored by all that she's able to juggle as a student in law school and also a beauty influencer and content creator. Let's start at the very beginning. Okay. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up. I was born in Dubai, which I have no memory of because I was very young. My family had immigrated to West Des Moines, Iowa when I was three. It was really just like me as a person of color mostly in any yeah. of my uh, classes. I think my first memory is really focused on like seeing my parents kind of get established in the United States okay. and like going grocery shopping with them and my two, I have two younger brothers um, kind of just helping parent them. You have a very motherly sort of demeanor. My brother was like, she was a dictator uh, <laughs> in the house. And I was like, you guys would have ruined your lives if you didn't have a dictator kind of running it behind the scenes. I'm, yeah, probably that person too. So what are your parents like? What did they do? And if you could just assign some sort of characteristics to set the scene on who they are. My dad, he's a like IT project manager, extremely hardworking. My mom, who is so similar to me in so many ways, extremely creative. Like she went to art school in Karachi. The way her mind works is crazy. Like her, um, ability to like solve a problem so quickly. Came, we like didn't have very many resources to be like, oh, we're gonna rent out a pizza truck this weekend, right? Um, but she would like kind of get inspo from what the other kids who were more established Aww. than I would get. And she's like, how can I re recreate it? Make it bigger and better on a budget. <laughs> Do you remember Libby Lou? No. It was like this this place that girls went and you would go and like they would turn you into a pop star or a princess. Okay. It was like all pink. It like Oh, it was like the place, but it was insanely wow. expensive, right? You have to rent out these little outfits to be the right. pop star and the makeup and the what. And so, like, this is so cool, but like, obviously, like, in, this is for the this is for the one percent. Yeah, um, yeah. My mom was like, "I can do this better," and like, we had this whole like, I think my fourth grade birthday or something. She had all like, every person we could imagine invited into her backyard, and her and her friends got together. They did our hair and makeup. They put us in dresses. I we had a photo that. shoot. She made us like all little custom purses. We decorated teacups, like. All these different things. So I think my mom like built this world around me where I had I really had little idea of like maybe some of the disadvantages or like some of yeah. the challenges they faced. I I didn't feel it. Although I think my parents put a lot of pressure of like oh like you know we didn't get to give you like everything. And I'm like to me it was yeah way more than everything. So yeah, that's them. Little brothers. They I feel like they're just like second like. <laughs> Second kids. I don't have first kids, so I guess the first kids. They're just kind of like my little sidekicks and um, adventure growing up. Like, and they they couldn't really ask for better because they only had me as a um, older sibling to go off of. So I'd be like, "We're doing a fashion show today. I'm going to put you in dresses. I'm going to put lip gloss on you." And they were like, "Okay." Um, and now they're like, "I cannot believe you. This is a this is harassment. Why did you do this to us?" <laughs> I feel like we're very close, and they're always calling with like life updates and what do I do and this is Aww. happening and so. So it's cute. I feel like it's, uh, yeah. And I, I like what you said about, you know, that dynamic with the sibling sort of shifting. I, I think for me as an older sister, I also got away with a lot with my little sister um, where I could just tell her what to do. I'm like, oh, like, bring me food on the couch. Why? Because I feel like it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no questions asked. So now she like gets really mad. She's like, I don't have to do it because you're not the boss of me. Um, so I'm waiting for the point till like after that where we're just like friends again on the same level. You have to right. tell someone. Yeah. And then eventually you get that juicy bit of information on them. Yeah. And you can finally tell them because it's like the, the threat of mutual destruction. Yes. And that is like the key to unlocking relationships with your siblings. Like you need Absolutely. you need dirt on each other. <laughs> you need to know that you're equally capable of like really ruining each other's lives with your parents. Yeah. And then it's all clear They're skies, standing. right? And then you beef, but it's all internal. It's like confidential after that. <laughs> I, lo I love that. The threat of mutual destruction. I think that's a great way to put a pin on the whole thing. I think that, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Your parents did a really good job of, of shielding you from it. Um, tell me about their journey as immigrants. School here and then college back in um, Pakistan. Oh, she, Her youngest brother, who passed when he was really young, he had health issues. And so they had come to Alabama. So she was here during that time, during his treatment. And then I, he unfortunately had passed. And, and so they had gone back, you know, moved back after college. Um, of course, they're set up by their siblings and whatnot. Yeah. And, you know, some some, <laughs> some see each other at a wedding, the standard. 
Um, weddings so, are yeah, a good one. It is. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my, that was my dream that like someone would get set up at my wedding and like my friends all failed me. Like, <laughs> no one cared enough about me to fall in love at my, <laughs> my event um, and make my dream come true. So it's very, very selfish of all of them. <laughs> but um, so they, yeah. I, and then yeah, I guess they got married a year, year and a half in or so there was me. And then my dad's like college friend had said, oh, one day Mustafa, like, um, I'm going to go to the United States. I'm going to start a company. I'm going to hire you. And like, it was just one of those like, yeah. ha ha, um, that literally happened. And wow. it happened to be in Iowa. And okay. so they were like, you know what? Let's try it out. We're going to be there for a couple months and just see. And then we'll come back. And yeah. then we, they went to Iowa and never left. Um, it just happened to work out. And they just kept building and building. And there were definitely like, there were definitely challenges. Like, um, I remember we had like one car um, and so during the day, my mom would like have to like walk us to different places. And we had a mall growing up close by. And so okay. we'd always go there. My little brothers, I feel like became more aware or, con- or conscious of like where our family was. Mm. Once they were a lot older, when, when my family had gotten a lot more established, brother Omer was born around 9-11, at least for my parents, like the first time that they really felt like, oh, we're well, like, we're very different because my dad had just gotten a job offer and our family was really excited about it. After 9-11, they were like, no, we're, like, we're retracting the software. You can't work for us anymore. And I'm That's thinking horrible. if I was, like, who I am now, like, I would have done something, like, right? Like, yeah. I would have And now that I'm older, I, like, thought I knew it all because I grew up with it and saw. Yeah. Brown dads always drop, like, these casual, insane stories. <laughs> that yeah. Unprovoked. And they, they treat it like a hee-hee-ha-ha ha, that it's like, wow, you didn't know that? And yeah. Then, and one of the stories he told me that was, like, really, like, stuck with me. He was like, oh, yeah, like, one of my first jobs – guy couldn't pronounce my name Mustafa like if you can watch the Lion King and talk yeah. say Mufasa it's very close um so he would just call me mustard well, mustard is crazy mustard is crazy that's that's horrible that's a fireable offense right like that's <laughs> like you can't do that to people yeah. um and he was like yeah that's just, it is what it is um, risk of coming to a new country not knowing exactly what they're getting into and Iowa of all places specifically, right, where there's not a lot of people that look like you, mm-hmm. I can only imagine it must have been isolating to not be able to share in your culture and, and maybe there's also identity crises that one goes through growing up, sort of feeling otherized. Um, so how was that experience for you in Iowa as a South Asian? People often comment like, oh, Hira wants to be a white girl so bad. And it's so funny to me because when I was growing up in Iowa and the only people who were popular, cool, and hot were white girls. That was my dream. I wanted to be a yeah, white blonde girl named we Tiffany. We all did. Right? And, um, and it took so much time for me to realize and recognize the value in, in my differences, in, right, that I can have dark hair and be beautiful in a different mm-hmm. way that is not superior or lesser than to other people. And, um, and you, but I didn't have, right, like any representation or like there wasn't like some cool hot mom or, or celebrity around that I could be like, oh, like I look like that at least, right? Like it was, and I also had a mustache. So even if there was a celebrity, I wouldn't have looked <laughs> like, like that. And I had my little glasses that my we had gotten made in Pakistan, these small gold frames and some where there was a purple frame. It was, it was a disaster. It's <laughs> adorable. Um, to peers in elementary school, the opposite of adorable. It's very gross and weird. And why is your name like that? It, it was kind of like a Hannah Montana life a little bit because there was like a smaller Pakistani community growing up. And so I would be able to do like cultural events and like different things there and like wear my clothes. And if I brought my cultural food to school, they'd be like, oh, why are you eating throw up? And I'm like, first of all, this is Masur Dal. But, um, <laughs> and it, it's funny because now people run towards all, they, they flock towards for the culture. Non. Yeah. Right? It's like, the most it's, frustrating. Oh, it's so frustrating. Um, character development. Yeah, character development, yeah. <laughs> Fourth grade, I was kicked out of class for having henna on my hands. What? By, yeah, by my teacher who was like, oh, you drew on your hands with in art class and how terrible of you. Even if I did, first of all, Let's talk about my body, my choice. But regardless, yeah. 12th grade. Oh, my God. And people are like, please do henna on, right? Like, yeah. And so I was like, now I have something that you don't, right? Like, yeah. it's like, I know how to do this. Um, and so you start valuing it a little bit more. And by the time I got to college, like, I was really proud to wear, like, I'd wear kurtas around um, my campus. How which, beautiful. It, and it was like, a, I was really proud to do it. I remember I begged my mom, I was like, can you just give me, like, a bunch of kurtas, like, once I realized, I was like, this is like a cool thing now. Yeah. Because, right? I'm like, oh, I want to be as Pakistani as possible. I want to be the Pakistani princess. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and there was very few of me. So I was like, yeah, like, this is like my my thing. Yeah. Um, and that was very empowering. And I think led me to, one, I like understand other people and the challenges that they had, had come from and 
help develop a more inclusive space and right um but just feel confident and happy not not feeling like i had to hide anymore and realizing that the the people who are pointing the fingers and saying like oh you're a terrorist or you're doing right xyz they're now the odd ones out yeah so um that that turn of the tables was really transformative for me yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and i love that you talked about the change in the dialogue i think how people that used to maybe be the majority in in a lot of areas of america now they are the bigoted minority Mm -hmm. um that you know well, actually, I guess I shouldn't say minority because we still have a lot of them out there. It is crazy uh, that, you know, now a, a lot of times modern day uh, social media culture will tell people that that's not okay. And I think that that's beautiful. Um, and I also want to get into social media a bit later too because I think that there's a lot of duality to it, right? It's a place for a lot of voices, um, which can be good and bad. But before we get there, uh, you touched a little bit upon your experiences in high school, in college. Uh, so tell me about your academic journey and what did you want to be when you were growing up? According to this like random paper from like kindergarten or something, it said lawyer, but then, um, wow, wow, but I don't know what she was thinking. What did you think a lawyer was at that age? I don't know. I really don't know. (laughs) I probably heard it. What probably was like talking back to someone and they said, oh, she's going to be a lawyer. And I said, great, let me add this to my kindergarten paper. I don't know. Um, cause I don't, I don't have any memory of wanting to be a lawyer growing up. Um, I remember feeling immense pressure to try and be a doctor. They'd like basically everyone in our community growing up, like all the successful people was like doctor, doctor, doctor. Right. And uh, right. It was like gold standard of success in this, this community and like ruined so many people's lives. Cause they're like, I am just like forcing myself to do this path yeah. that I don't actually care about. I, I think for a long time I had just fought to be someone that was perceived as successful. And that was like, right, like this immense pressure from the community, right? Like my parents had sacrificed so much. They'd worked so hard. My, like, I just, and I was the oldest daughter, right? Like I was like, I want to just make this all, every sacrifice my parents have ever made worth it. I want them to sit and be like, we, right? Like all of this has been worth it because like she, like our daughter at least accomplished X, Y, Z. And they had never like, right. They never like said, you know, we expect this of you, right? But seeing the, the excitement in them when I would be like, oh, like, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to do this. And like, like that was a transformative thing, right? For them to go from grudgy to then like being able to have a a daughter grow up to be a doctor in in the United States would would have been a big deal. Uh If you want to get a hundred percent on your Pakistani report card, (laughs) that's the way to do it. Um, And anything less sure, like maybe you have some other A's on there, but like overall you missed the big mark. In college, I like tried so hard. I like the cl- I was like failing my first cl- like a, it was like I took a math for biological science. I literally failed the cl- like it was so bad. I had to drop out. Yeah. And I was like I had never I mean, done that bad it, academically ever. Yeah. Um, and I was shocked. I was like I'm gonna I'm gonna fail college. Like this is so <laughs> bad. And then I tried to switch to God. What did I think? And I tried to switch to business. I couldn't do accounting to save my life. Numbers are not my thing. <laughs> accounting is not a fun um, one. I will say. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody that works in finance, I will say, accounting is the worst part if of it. If you know numbers, I think you are like I, your pedestal is up here. You are my Simone Biles of <laughs> academics. <laughs> um, but being in law school requires so much reading. No. Yeah, I can read. See, I'm the opposite. I'm like, I don't have the attention span to read document after document. What I can do is crunch some numbers on Excel. I love uh, that. <laughs> I, and the world uh, needs both. You know that? Yeah, that's yeah. true. This is true. Yeah. Like, I did that. My, my friend, like, loves geology. And I'm like, I'm so glad someone cares about rocks so that I don't have to, right? Like, <laughs> there you go. That's um, the way to look at it. I yeah. love that. And I think finally, like, towards the end of it, I, I was like, I kind of conceded. I was like, okay, I'm a failure. Like, I, <laughs> it's not going to work. I'm never going to be able to, like, do this gold standard. I've let my parents and the universe down. But, like, it is what it is. I just suck. Sure. And, not true, uh, but sure. Yeah, yeah, But, like, right, like, the the thought in the head is, like, okay, well, like, biggest loser, let's see, what you what are you going to do now? Yeah. I had done improv comedy for, Whoa. Uh, I did it all throughout high school and all, all throughout college. And that had been, like, a a kind of a grounding thing. Like I had so much fun and so much enjoyment there. And I think that was like kind of an area, like the humor is kind of how I coped with a lot of these like different challenges and barriers. This makes a lot of sense because as we're filming this right now, I was like, I didn't know that you had so much like, like pizzazz and and humor (laughs) and and firecracker in you. I I had no clue. And it it makes sense now that you used to improv. I'm like, you are actually hilarious. It's almost embarrassing, right? To be like, I did this and now people are like, so you think you're funny. And I'm like, I, I enjoy making people laugh and I, I enjoy those moments. But um, Your husband's a lucky man. You guys must be he, laughing all the time. Well, it's funny because I, so I, partly why I married my husband is because he is one of the few people, let alone men, 
that like genuinely make me belly laugh. I, it is, wow. it, I find it real, like, especially because when you're, you're in the comedy space, you analyze and break down jokes a lot. Like you just like, you yes. think about them in a different way. When I watch a funny movie, I would be sitting there like watching it like this the whole time and people would be like, you hated that movie. I was like, no, I think that's brilliant. <laughs> but I was analyzing the way they yeah. structure, right? And I'm just like, like in awe yeah. of how they created those. You're studying moments. it. Yeah, I'm studying it. Belly laughing to tears. That's that's my husband, and people don't see that side of him because he is so shy and Aww. so quiet, and so people don't know. But he like th- the moments that I'm like, wow, like wow, yeah. wowed by him, are, are moments that we are just laughing together. Um, I so love actually, that. I I genuinely do think my husband is far funnier than I am, but people won't know it. So benefit for wow. me. Wow, it's a real secret. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. love that. Yeah. Wow, that's so cute. So going back, yeah, to the college. So where did you go to school, and what did you end up majoring in? So I studied ethics and public policy, went to University of Iowa. Nice. Um, I had like some business studies. I had to scrap together the business credits. Uh, so they had some <laughs> some random major that I could kind of build up like to it. adding on there. DIY. So I, uh, DIY. <laughs> uh, added that in there. Um, and I think ethics and public policy was really like I had a profound interest in politics and like advocacy work. I, okay. I ran for student body president in Iowa. Wow. Um, and somehow this predominantly white institution said, that's the one. Um, wow. And they elected me, which was crazy yeah. to represent, like, right, like 24,000 students in the Midwest, in Iowa of all places, um, and look like me, which was really, really crazy. And to this day, like, something I am so proud of. But I think Iowa was really such a huge training ground. Think like a white person, yeah. right? Like, um, the way that you negotiate the way that you stand up for yourself the way right it like gives you some audacity yeah um because if you don't have that audacity like you're left in the dust exactly Um, you got left behind yeah and the same as like being like i'm sure like finance is like a heavy male (laughs) dominated industry right like yeah it it is thankfully now that i work in in beauty Mm -hmm. it's it's there's more well the finance team's still more guy but you know i i think um there's more women in this space but yeah no to what your to your point when i back when i was on wall street i had to learn how to navigate all these different men you know yeah so, yeah and you have to write people stop using so many exclamation points so that they get taken seriously <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so the, like but those are things that you don't necessarily learn those little things right until you're in that right. environment so for yeah. me I grew up around a place where I would be the only person who looked like me and that trained yeah. me to then have the audacity to ask for more and I see that now in like the way that I can negotiate brand deals or the way that I can stand up for myself or wow. argue with people I think it lends a lot a lot into law as well, um, to have the audacity to stand up and speak up and say absolutely not to someone, yeah. which I, I think especially for like, they see women, right? That's it's like hard. absolutely the opposite it's of culture. So it's like, shut up, be quiet and like sit with your legs closed. Yeah. And, and bend over backwards for, for other people and, and never complain about how much you're suffering, but do suffer, please. Yes. And, and yes. I, I love that you're saying that you kind of had to go against the grain and say, no, I'm going to, you're going to be the leader that you were meant to be in this world. Yeah. And you're going to go for it and lead all these people that don't, that look nothing like you. And you have to learn how to, to talk the talk, walk the walk. And I love that you have that experience at such a young age. I mean, college is relatively young, right? Yeah. When, you, when you go through the grand scheme of life. I have a theory um, that student government nerds all find each other in the real world. Um, so you're sitting with one. Um, oh too. my God, <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense, right? When you, when you connect all the dots. Yeah. Um, but no, it was a bit different for me because the student body that I, I was never president, um, but I was, you know, part of cabinet. And, That's awesome. Um, the student body I was representing actually did look like me because I was, you know, in the, in the Bay Area for high school and college. Um, and I, I just can't imagine. I just don't know how you did it. Like, I, I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes, running the elections and campaigns that I ran to win office, but with people that didn't look like That's really scary. Even during my, right, during my um, term... They, like, tried to impeach me. There was, like, a, well, right, like, a petition to, like, impeach this this girl. She, whatever, like, the, anything disagreed with. Like, people would villainize me in such strange ways, yeah. right? Like, um, I remember I had, like, whatever. I had written this dissent of, like, why, like I'm vetoing this thing, and here's my reasoning, or whatever. Like, the, it's, like, so meaningless now. <laughs> you look back, you're like, why are we beefing about such a, such a stupid thing? Um, but I remember someone had stood up during, right, the Senate, and we were the exec was supposed to sit in the back and be quiet, as to not influence. Um, and I remember this girl stood up and she was like, what President Mustafa has wrote has struck fear into the hearts of our constituents. And like, she, like people are scared of her. And I was like, whoa, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why is it me? Like, it, it was just <laughs> so, I was like, what is going on? It sounds on? Like, like there was a target on your back. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, 
in many ways, I felt like there was a target on my back. But also, I was like, it's not new. Um, yeah. So it is what it is. I know you were in consulting as well, mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. now you're in law school. So just give me a high level. What were you doing as a consultant, and where were you working, and, and all that? So I was working at Accenture. Um, I did a lot of change management consulting work, and it was all about people. I feel like everything that excites me has to do with people and how I can impact, like see a person that I'm impacting. Yeah. And um, and so I was doing that. I was enjoying it, and it kind of sucked because I felt like I was really good at my job, but I I wasn't like getting the the like human element of it enough like I wanted to like yes like I can help you with your technology change absolutely um but like I right this is not something that once it's accomplished is going to move me to tears if in in pride sure um and at the same time right like I'd be in my meetings and I would see I was supposed to move to Minneapolis I moved there for one week the pandemic hit I had to move straight back to Iowa and George Floyd's protests right all of that was happening literally on the street that I would have been living in if I had stayed in Minneapolis. And so I'm wow. looking right at the news and I'm seeing the apartment buildings I would have walked past on my way to work, all of this stuff. And I felt so helpless. I was like, what? Like, I'm like helping with like technology stuff and like the world is burning. Like there's so many things going on. There's so many people that need help. And I'm sitting here like, I have nothing to offer this. And that it, it was so different from college because I was always on, right? Like I was on stage just arguing for people and, and writing speeches to like fight for change. And then that all of a sudden, right? You graduate college and if you're not working in politics or public policy, it's like gone. And yeah. that was, I was like, what, like, what's the point of me? Like, what am I really doing? Um, and so at that point it was like, okay, like I need to consider law. My husband, uh, you know, had come into my life at that point. Um, and we had connected on our shared like care and interest of politics and like he was just like it's very clear that you are like there's something there's like a pull yeah. to you of some of something different um and so I ended up applying to law school and thinking like I'm gonna go work in like social justice realm and 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 do all of that um and then I got to law school and you learn quickly that it's like very challenging to have a livable wage and do those jobs it's also mm-hmm. um just gut-wrenching work um and I was like okay you know and so as I'm looking into this and trying to find a balance Um, a year before I had started law school, I had started social media. It was a time when my husband and I were talking, we weren't even like even boyfriend, girlfriend, like we were were talking at this point and, um, he had like, he had to study for step one or some, some medical exam, something. And I had my job at a center that I was working virtually. And then after that was done, I had nothing to do. And I honestly just felt kind of like a loser. I was like, wow, like I'm, I have this job, whatever, but like, after I'm done, I just wait around for a man to text me. Like, I was like, no, I like yeah, can't, I can't fair. be like, I, I didn't like it. Um, yeah. And so I was like, I need something. But it was hard, right? Because comedy was taken away. I didn't have a, I couldn't be doing this during COVID. Um, right, right. right, and right. So the things that usually that I'm like, this is what I do, you know, that that are that is part of me was taken away. And so I was like, God, like, this is embarrassing. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to feel that way. Um, and so I said, what could I be so excited about to do that I don't, I don't spend every time thinking of like, oh, like when is that going to be done with this thing so that I can like, you know, yeah. we can talk again. Cause I enjoy talking to him. Um, and so I started doing content and not even with no big plan or dream. It was really like, I really always enjoyed being an entertainer. I loved telling stories. Yes. I loved talking to people and that was hard to do during COVID and, um, just started sharing little bits and bobs of, you know, my life, makeup, skincare, what, what not. And it was so rough at the beginning. It was so embarrassing. G- getting um, started is the uh, most painful and embarrassing you part. You have of to do it, but it's so embarrassing. On social media. It's because then people, you know, are seeing it and you know what goes through. Oh God, she wants to be an influencer. She's scroll. She's trying so hard. Yeah, no, it, it, it's the yeah. worst. It is yeah, yeah, yeah. the worst. Oh, it. <laughs> yeah. it sucks. It yeah. sucks <laughs> so bad. Um, <laughs> but then when it works, everyone's like, oh my God. So I plot, yeah, so I'm doing content, doing social media, and then started develop, developing this platform as I was like applying and started law school and just started sharing little bits of like moving to New York City and being a woman in this field and just just life, like just what I would call my friends about at the end of the day. If they were yeah. busy, I'd be like, let me tell the internet. Um, <laughs> and they, for whatever reason, uh, listened. And it, it was, 
I realized that I think the thing that I was really craving in my career or in my life was the ability to talk about things that I care about mm. and be able to, one, bring awareness to other people of things that I care about and to move them in some direction to either take action, to vote, to um, change how they act, yeah. to have a conversation, whatever it is for them. And now that I've had this and you like it unlocks the entire world right like yes. you talk about these things and no I don't think there's like another job that I could have that would give me like this amount of reach and allow me the flexibility to talk about whatever I care about I don't have to pick one issue I can talk about a hundred issues yeah um whatever is moving me on that day that year whatever and that is so powerful and to see then also right like I just applied to this it's a Sephora squad thing and oh yes uh, I saw yeah and so Um, I, so people had written testimonials. I expected five people maybe to do it, several of them being my husband. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, and seeing like the responses, because people don't like, people don't really comment nice stuff on social media. Like people don't really take that much time. It's kind of weird, right? To be like, you mean this to me and this is the impact. Like people don't take the time to tell people, forget like people on the internet, right? Like you can think it, but it never really comes out. But people took the time to, to do that. And like for the first time in like months, maybe over a year, I've like been reminded of the impact and like the lives wow. that I've been in touch or like the people I've connected with or like what my role has been to someone else. Because you don't get, where well, you don't get an annual report. You don't have a yeah. boss doing there social media. There is no review. You have haters, but you don't really have a boss. Um, <laughs> it reminded me why I enjoy this yes. so, so much. Um, yes. So yeah, I feel re-energized to do that. And now, now I'm trying to figure out because it does like it's a such a powerful tool. Yeah. And you get insight into how the world works and like with the upcoming election, right? Like yeah. being able to talk about things, Supreme Court cases, right? Like it's you hear buzzwords and headlines, but like what does it actually mean for yes. me, for you, for the the guy walking down the street? Yeah. To be able to take such complicated language, right? This is like it's such a gate kept subject the law yeah. like right like if, you, if, if everyone could understand the law we wouldn't have to pay lawyers as much as we do right so of course we have an incentive to be like oh no it's, it's too complicated pay me yeah. 800 dollars an hour to do it for you um but no I, I think it's so important to make these things that impact people day to day accessible and and feel like wow like i do have a stake in this and there is an yeah. action i can take that's going to be meaningful yeah and so it is an important part of my life still and i i want to you know pass the bar and be a, a practicing lawyer and now I just have the, the brilliant task of trying to figure out how these worlds will collide and kind of mix together. I think they'll come together in a very beautiful, serendipitous way. We don't know what yet. I hope. Um, but <laughs> co- please come back and share it because it yeah. sounds like you've taken all these different passions from these different realms of life. And I said this to you off camera too, but I really feel like you're like an Elle Woods. Oh. Like in a way, like you have this like beauty and, and charisma and you dress well. Um, but you also have this like very driven part of you that, that wants to go after success, um, in a much more level-headed way than Elle Woods, I will say, um, if, if that means anything. I did not submit a bikini application. Yeah, though, no, I, I didn't My parents would have so. killed me before I would have gotten to it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, and I, I love how you bring all of this together and are doing it your way. It, it's your path to claim. And I think you're going to do something amazing with it. Um, have you seen How I Met Your Mother? No. Uh, okay, well, there's this, there's this character, Marshall, um, uh-huh. and he, he goes through a journey. He's not nearly as multidimensional and multifaceted as you, um, but he is a very simple kind of guy. And his biggest thing is he, you know, he goes into law school wanting to be an environmental lawyer because his mm. biggest thing is wanting to save the planet from climate crisis. Um, and he gets to the other side, and then he starts looking at how much different jobs pay. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, oh, okay, uh, corporate law it is. Um, yeah. And he, he does that, but it's only for so long uh, until he completely um, loses his ability to show up to work. And, and mm-hmm. then he quits and does something that's, you know, more, um, I think he does actually end up being an environmental lawyer at some point. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm rewatching the series mm-hmm. right now. I forget what happens at the end, but I'm at the part where, you know, he, he's doing that. Um, and it's a different sort of life. There are ways... I would imagine um, for somebody that's as entrepreneurial as you to carve out your own path that sort of, you know, pays the bills, but also brings in your love for beauty, content, connecting with people, right? Um, And also just your raw ability to understand and analyze information um, that most people don't want to do. Like, I'm one of those people. It's like, ah, I don't want to read this document. (laughs) Um, So, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that's that's very kind. Um, And also, I think I was 
as you were even just off camera, just being like the like your description of me was so. I don't know. You were like, oh, like you're this multifaceted person, and you have like right, like like this beauty and academics and all this. And I, I think it was like kind of a, a mental check for me because I feel like I've been really hard on myself like I've been talking to I got it. my husband right and he is like oh like you're you're gonna graduate law school soon and I was like it's dumb like I, I like it's not a big deal it's not a big deal to me and he's like this is a big deal it it's really deal. important right and I was like it doesn't feel like anything to me and it's and I, but right but like for a couple years ago I'd have been like oh that's great um and like so many times it was like these milestones or whatever yeah. like I it's it's hard and maybe it's like part of my right like being they say you don't sit and think about oh wow good job today like yeah pat right? on the back no yeah. <laughs> um and every it seems like you fight so hard to get to like a milestone accomplishment and then once you get there you're like oh well yeah what crickets now? like what now like what else right like if i and i feel like every time i i achieve something i think if i can do it it's really not that special and it's like, did you, did that happen to you? Yes, 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 it's yes, It's such a yes. mean thing to say, but it it's, feels so real. It's really, I, I think there's a few layers to it. Um, I, I think the first one is, I do think, this is something my dad tells me. Hmm. Um, you know, I tell him, like, you know, I, I did this thing, I have this accomplishment, blah, 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 but, but I, dad, I don't feel like, I, I don't know, I, I just, I can't spend too much time thinking about it. Like, I want to do the next thing. Like, yeah. what's next, what's next? And he always reminds me, he's like, you have spent so much time climbing the mountain that you never look down at all the people you've passed on your way up all you do is look up yeah and you keep wanting more and he's like that's a beautiful thing but take us take a second sometime just look down just take a peek down and I'm like no I don't want to do that I'm not narcissistic I don't need to pat myself on the back I'm fine I'm fine um but I I think it's it's a really interesting thing and I, I love what you said about you're getting to this point um it's it's a it's a big cusp in your life in your journey right where you're going to go out into the world after law school and it kind of feels like it's not a big deal. And I, I, that's exactly how I felt. Not that it's the same level at all. Um, but when I graduated from college, like I, I yeah. clawed my way to get into Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, you know, thank yeah. you. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm going to do this. Um, and, and same thing with Wall Street. I clawed my way to get into Wall Street. And then every time I got to the finish line, I was like, mm, I don't know. You know? And, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I, it's, it's a weird thing. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Um, and I remind myself, you know, maybe sometimes it's that it gets lonely at the top. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you get there and you just kind of are like, eh, what was all that for? Um, but I know it was for good reason, right? When you're pursuing yeah. it, there, there's yeah. good reason. Um, and even afterwards, you can look back in hindsight. But there's moments of dissociation is, is, is how I think of it. Mm-hmm. Where you're just so detached from all of it. Um, and I think that's part of the ebb and flow. And I, w- I want to know who all this happens to. Like, is it a South yeah. Asian women thing? Is it a women thing? Is it a, yeah. is it a us two and no one else? Right? Like, <laughs> um, it is. It's like such a defeating feeling. Yes. Yes, I and think it's, it's an ambitious, per- perpetually ambitious people thing, maybe. Maybe, I guess. Maybe that's what drives you to keep doing it. I feel like it also goes so much to, like, my self-worth, right? Well, um, there, there's that piece of it. If yeah. I'm not, if this is it, yeah. I'm done with anything I'm ever, ever going to accomplish, right? Like, it's like, yeah. a, what's next so I can s- keep having things to feel proud of myself for? Yeah. Um, if any therapists are listening, <laughs> yeah, let us uh, give us a, a call. Perhaps a freebie diagnosis here. <laughs> I heard this from someone years ago, and I've tried to incorporate it into my life since. But it's, if you think something kind about someone, you have to say it out loud. I feel like I just always do, um, and it's really changed my perspective mm-hmm. on like people. Like sometimes I'm like, oh wow, like I think this thing you're doing is so cool. I'm so impressed by this. I'm sure you hear it all the time. And they're like, I've literally never heard this. Wow, and. Right, like part of part of battling that is also having a community or people mm. that see you and like right, like you you're just when you were getting ready to do the show and I was just thinking I was like admiring the setup. I was like, this is insane <laughs> that you've been able to put this together and figure this out. My mind is so blown. Your Wall Street background, like to me, I'm like, this is like a, such a cool badass person. Wow. I think you're Thank such you. an exceptional conversationalist. Like, I'm, like this is the thing I'm gonna think about going to sleep tonight. Is just how in awe I am of you and how inspired I am. And I'm like, wow, like what can what bits and pieces of inspiration can I take to incorporate into my life? But <laughs> but so many times when people think that about us, yeah, they don't, don't say, say it. it. And then we don't hear it. And right until yeah. but you hear right the criticisms and, and all the right. Especially with social media gets amplified, oh, right? And, yeah, 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 that's like a whole different <laughs> piece. Yeah, and that's why right, like the, these testimonials that came in, I was like, I've never I didn't know. You felt that way, yeah. And and so many times you we say all these great things, right? Like when people are gone, or once they've made it to the very top, and it's like, oh, I've been a silent supporter of yours for years. 
Why? Yeah, I don't but like right, I like I know we have silent supporters, but but like I just like spit it out. If you, like, their hair looks nice or they smell good or what? Yeah. Like I just I, if it's strangers on the subway, I just say it because you just never know. Like people could be thinking it's their yeah. worst day, it's their last day. Like you just don't. You know. just don't know. It's been life changing to just be very generous with like what I say, and I'm always truthful. I'm not just like coming up with stuff. You're not to making say. stuff. It's genuine. Yeah. You saying that about me, I was like, oh my god. I was like, stop. Don't be crying about this. You haven't even started recording. <laughs> but um, I was like, oh god, I'm very moved by this. And then I was like, this is this is how other people also feel when you when you tell them what you're thinking about yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you for saying all the kind things you said about me. Um, yeah, I, I I think it's one of those things where I, I saw this TikTok that was like one of the greatest tragedies is we never truly know how loved we are. Um, and I think you could translate that to this conversation as one of our biggest tragedies and many others is we don't know how many people might think that what we're doing is cool or that yeah. we're highly capable or that we're having some sort of an impact because we're so hard on ourselves. I'm, I'm a big numbers person, right? We kind of alluded to this earlier. I, I, I Whenever I accomplish something, I, I always make it unspecial. Mm. To your point, I just go, well, if really, if we're in a world of 7 billion people, if you do the math and statistically speaking, blah, 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 I'm not that special, you know? Mm. Um, and I, I think that about every like niche ambitious thing that I've thankfully with the grace of God and my family like accomplished, but yeah, it's just, it's really weird. So, so to hear it said out loud is really like, Oh, Whoa. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So thank it's you. like crazy. Like it's like you're, <laughs> someone's talking about someone in a movie. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, I remember <laughs> there was this time in college, I was waiting at the bus stop. This random girl came up to me and she was like, Hey, are you here? I was like, yeah. She's like, can I ask you something? I was like, sure. She's like, I could just use some, like, how do you get confidence? Like, I have a date tonight with this guy. (laughs) And I want to just feel, like, so good and so confident. Or I guess she had the the date the next day. And she just wanted advice. And I said, look, (laughs) you're going to go home. You're going to print out your resume. And you're going to read it. (laughs) <laughs> read it every line read it and go to sleep and she's like why I was like no like really read it and think about all the work that has gone into every line and every word of that right and wow. for some people it's not their resume right like it's not about your academics and GPA sure, and all, right sure but it, it's it's yeah whatever it is your stories or, or like right like sometimes people have like happy folders on their phone where it's just like nice things people have said to yes, them, whatever like yes. those things as like a real sit down moment and reflection of like, yeah. what did I really like? What's what's the highlight reel? And watching that kind of in your head, kind of is a helpful reminder to kind of pull you back out of the trenches to be yeah. like, yeah, it's not just what you did this week; it's all of the years that came before that too. I love that. I love. She had that a great so date much. after. She told me after. So good, <laughs> good. So we've talked a lot about people um, and sort of dynamics, the thoughts that we have in our heads, the thought that the thoughts that we have about others. Um, I, th- I think it's really interesting when you kind of pull all of that together when it comes to groups of people, right? Organizations, communities, with things that we're both familiar with, right? With a history in student government and, and also having sort of these Pakistani Muslim communities that we're brought up in. I want to understand what is your relationship like with, with the Muslim community, the Pakistani community, and how has that sort of shaped who you are in the present in, in good ways and bad ways? So many brown women that I talk to have such complicated relationships with the people they grew up with I think part of that is social societal pressures Mm -hmm. some of that is immaturity because you are kids growing up with with one another and trying to figure out how to balance life um and so I was very grateful growing up to have like a group of Pakistani girls to be friends with to like be able to go to Eid dinner with Mm -hmm. right we've got IHOP or like there's little things and um and that was really special and I remember I have very fond memories of it when I was really young. And then I think as we got older, there was so many pressures of competition of like, who's going to get the best grades? Who's going to go to med school? Who's going to get the fanciest proposal? Who's going to, right? Like all these little things trickled in and what be, it turned like these like innocent childhood friendships of people who would sleep over together every weekend into like, seeing each other's competition so unnecessarily Mm. but it felt so real of like wow like if they get this I'm gonna have to keep up and and so much of it right is like I want to make my parents proud if she goes to med school and she does it 
why can't I? Or, you know, yeah. like, are my parents going to be like, oh, we got the bad egg, right? Like, it's all these different things. And, and part of it is like all of our own insecurities, right? That are fed onto us by the community, by society. Yeah. And we end up wrongfully then taking out on each other. And there are so many things, right? Little like immature things that I did growing up that I am so, right? Looking back at it, I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, wh- how, like, why? Why was I beefing with some, you know, this, this girl I grew up with or whatever? And, um, but all of us kind of participated in that, right? Like just like the snippy, sure. the judgment, the backbite, all that stuff. And, and you, so many people go through that phase sometimes and it's not a pretty thing to look back on. And I think there's two approaches after it's like, okay, like I'm just going to put this behind me and be a better person moving forward. Sure. For me, I think, and my mom is really good about this. I hope one day I am better at it. I try to be, but my mom, no matter how bad someone has wronged that woman, if someone has done something kind for her at some point in her mm. life, even if it was day one, she'll never forget it. Yeah. And she's like, that's the person you remember who was there for you on your bad day, not whatever happened after that. And I'm like, no, mom, like boundaries and like, you gotta stand up, <laughs> right? Like the, the lawyer in me is like, no, right? Yeah. Sue them. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> not the lawsuit. I'll joke, I'll joke, I'll joke. <laughs> um, but, it's really like having grace and mm. one be, being humble enough to know like I've really messed up too and I, I'm the villain in other people's stories too and it's not fair for me to be like oh it's just it's all on them right like I, I've definitely contributed to the like that unnecessary animosity and just competition and and so I think as I've gotten older and I had time away from the community I had time away from the community and was able to reflect in one like was able to tackle my own insecurities and mm. feel more proud of who I am and my path and not so much because it's better than yours or worse than hers, right? Um, and once you have that, once you're actually genuinely happy and and your success is not based off of what the person next to you is doing, then it's a lot easier to take a step back and be like, oh gosh, like I gotta say sorry. Um, wow. And, and so a lot of the, I, I, I think I tried to make a really... Um, it's a concerted effort. Yeah, concerted yeah. effort to um, reach out to like rebuild the bonds and be like, "Hey, we did stupid, mean stuff to each other when we were young. I'm sorry. Like, it, it was unnecessary. And like, right? Like, it's my fault, and it's also the society's fault, right? Like, um, and I've tried to extend a friendly hand back to say, "Hey, like, I've grown from this. I'm not the same person." If you're comfortable, I'd like to like continue being friends and like actively cheer you on and not in wow. like this fake way. Um, and for some people that that worked. And now I have really beautiful friendships with people that I grew up with that I grew right in some tumultuous time in our life. I was like, sure. we're never going to be friends again. <laughs> and now I'm like moved to tears by their successes. I'm so proud of them. And I feel that same love and support from them, too, that I would have never expected. And, in, in, yeah. you know, like just things that they remember and um, cheer me on through. And it's so beautiful. And at the same time, there are also some relationships that it could not be rekindled, could sure. not be fixed. And I I think you have to just kind of be honest with yourself and be like, okay, if I messed up, let me let me try. Let me send a send an olive branch. Yeah. And if they don't want to receive it and it's their right not to receive it, um, that's okay. But yeah. now I feel a lot more at peace of, like, I've tried to make my amends. You've like done your now, part. Now they know that I've, you know, I'm not rooting against them by any means. And yeah. I'm, like, content in living my own life and and have grown from those experiences. And this, like, competitive thing, this whole concept of girls are so much drama. You, you know, I like to have boyfriends. Like, the things that we hear growing <laughs> up, right? And then you have genuine girl friendships and you're like, wow, like, I would actually not survive without this. Like, this yeah. is, like, the most beautiful friendship um just unconditional love that you can receive is like from fellow women I think um so that great memories some bad memories and then a very like uplifting hopeful path for our yeah. future and hopefully no unnecessary beef ever again uh because yeah. we're all perfect and mature now so <laughs> <laughs> uh first of all thank you for sharing I I know it's not an easy thing to talk about the past and especially places in which we weren't perfect, right? Mm-hmm. It's really easy to get caught up in this, you know, again, social media, every everything, every digital footprint is permanent real estate, right? 
Um, and I love that even with that being the case, you're one to stand up and proudly say, hey, I've screwed up, but I also have done my what I can to make amends. And I, I really applaud you for going back and apologizing because people don't, a lot of people don't do that. It's hard. Right? And they're it all, feels icky. It, it, it feels, right, there are a lot of people I think back to my life, and I don't, I don't harbor any resentment. I think the phase of life that I've been in the past two years after being in New York is, you know, everything happened for a reason. And mm -hmm. I, I really want I want the best for people, really. Um, but, yeah, there are some people that, that can't apologize, either whether they can't admit it to themselves um, or if they can, they, it, it's, it's embarrassing to reach back out to that. It's scary. And I, I get that. You know, it's, it's human emotions are complex. Yeah. People are so multidimensional and it, it's really hard to understand the intricacy of emotion, but I love that you kind of rose above all of that and said, I need to right my wrongs. And I, I don't, it's okay if it's not received. And I love, we you know what I love what you said is the, you know, the olive branch was not accepted in all cases and that's their right. And I think it's important to shed light on these dynamics, especially in an upbringing in such a competitive environment. You know, South Asian parents have, the, not even just South Asians, Asian parents, or there's lots of groups of people that do this to their kids. They pit them against each other and create this like very unhealthy competitive environment. Yeah. And then it, it creates trauma. It creates competition amongst people that, that should be able to be friends. Um, it creates resentment. It creates distance. And it's, it's a really sad thing. I grew up in, in Cupertino, California, mm. which is like a very um, ultra competitive, ultra immigrant dominated environment. And boy, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for where I grew up. But I have to say, I've seen, I've seen the impact it has on people. There are people that I know I grew up with that I went to school with that I know as adults are fully unhealed and, and traumatized. After growing up in that environment, I think it, at least in my experience, it was very easy to just distrust people yes. in the community or any any like they see person I'm like I talk to you you're going to tell your secrets to my your mom she's going to call my mom I'm in trouble yeah and or like you're going to just spread gossip or what right like my yeah. the experiences growing up and and so but what that did was that right like although I have wonderful friends who are not they see in Iowa growing up they never were fully able to understand or relate to the challenges that I had, mm -hmm. right? Like marriage and proposals and all these different things yeah. and like all these pressures. They were like, you tell some of your white friends, oh, like I'm, my mom like said this thing to me. And they're like, wow, that sounds like abuse. You should leave your house. <laughs> and you're like, Samantha, no, <laughs> can't do that. That's not in the playing cards. <laughs> and right, but your they see friends are like, damn moms, you know, like, but think of what the trauma she went through with her in-laws, right? Like, like they know, they know the next thing to say. And I missed out on so much of that, right? And it was the the, the time that the light bulb went off of how valuable this was, was, was in college. Incredible, incredible friend. Um, she's Indian. And she she texts, she was texting me and she's like, I just need to vent. Like, I'm having a terrible day. Da, da, da. And, um, and she's like, I'm literally sitting in a bathroom crying right now. And I was like, what is going on? Like, where are you? just so happened that in the city that we were in, I was having lunch at the restaurant next to the whatever, some coffee shop okay. that she was in the bathroom crying at. And I was oh, like, wow. I'm literally next door. I'm coming. Yeah. And I ran over there and she was like very, very upset and had just like, just we, she sobbed into me and was talking about how her parents were putting so much pressure on her to go to med school and said, if you don't go to med school, we're going to get you married off. And like, oh, what is she going to do? And I was like, oh my God, right? Like, this is crazy. Yeah. Samantha's never going to understand that. <laughs> never. Um, I'm so sorry. I also totally get like I, this happened, all this yeah. stuff, right? And the, the bond that we built in that coffee shop bathroom, like, will withstand the test of time. Like, her opening walk in? up. No. <laughs> At least, I, honestly, it was kind of like a, it's just me and you, babe. Like, I don't know if anyone got in there. But um, her opening up to me and being vulnerable and being like, yeah. I'm going to trust you with this huge load of information. Yeah. And you're not going to go on Facebook tomorrow and be like, oh, so-and-so's parents are crazy. Um Right, like she was the first person that then I felt comfortable being like, hey, like I feel these pressures. Um, yeah. And she was there for me in a way that no one else could have been because they don't know what it is like to grow up with our identity. And since then, I have been so much better about like being more vulnerable and allowing the space for other people and yes. like keep shutting my mouth, right? Like people will share stuff with me and it's no one's business. 
And I'm yeah. like, you're a listening ear and you give the advice. And then I, first I have a really bad memory so that it helps with keeping secrets because I never <laughs> remember what people tell me. I have that problem they have as to, well. They have to do the recap. Being able to have someone that you can trust to share those experiences with is life changing. I think especially when it's hard to get therapy, hard for yes. people to be like, I need therapy. Um, those things are about as close as a lot of people get mm. to having people being like, you're not alone and you're not crazy. Yeah. Um, and I think we could, as a society could benefit. And I think so, especially South Asian women, if we just are willing to be trusted and can be trusted yeah. and show and that we're trustworthy and, yeah. and not going to, you know, do the auntie gossip thing that yeah. we've seen growing up. So. Yeah. They've saved me from many mental breakdowns <laughs> in just one phone call. So I love that. So we're going to pivot to a hot seat segment. <laughs> 